Good morning. It has been a minute since I've been up here. Um, I had the, I'm, I'm a little less nervous. I guess it's my second time to do it this morning. So a little, the nerves were really, really kicking before that first service this morning. But um, I'm feeling pretty good right now. And that what that means for you is um, get comfortable because it's probably going to go longer than, uh, than that timer is allowing me. <laughs> now, I did go longer in the first service. I kind of knew as I was preparing for this one, it's, we're covering a lot. And so it is going to go long. But Robbie will, will likely still hold the record um, <laughs> b at the end of the message. So um, just saying. Um, it has been just over six months since these two church bodies, um, God began working among them. He was already working in each one and then began working behind the scenes the way God does, you know, doing this amazing thing of bringing these two church bodies together. Um, the Brook had been praying for a new lead pastor and, you know, what what is our next step here as a church? Um, Robbie and Jonathan and Village Park Church and their leaders and, and church body, they had been praying about what, you know, they were a church plant, eight years church plant without a, without a campus, um, you know, and they'd been meeting in elementary schools. And so um, they, they were looking for something too. What is it that God had for them? And the amazing thing is that God united these two church families. It, it, it was about six months ago that that process kind of began, and then it's been, uh, I guess, just around five months or so that we've been united here, and it's really still an amazing story that God is writing here with these two churches. Um, Robbie preached a, a message called A Tale of Two Churches. It was back in September, uh, right before he officially came on as the lead pastor here, and I'll never forget something that he said. He told that story about the two churches praying separately for things, but that God answered the prayers of both churches in one way, and that was he, he provided a family. He brought us all together and created this beautiful, combined, united uh, spiritual family here at the Brook. And we throw that word amazing around a lot. You know, oh, it was amazing. Man, that, that key lime pie was amazing. But, <laughs> and key lime pie is pretty good. But, I mean, amazing, when I think of amazing, I think of that song, Amazing Grace. And I'm thinking about what God is doing and the things that God does. And those things are truly amazing. And so it really kind of puts that word in perspective for me. So we're going to talk about that this morning. We're talking about family, spiritual family. And we're going to look at how Jesus modeled this in the Gospels. We're going to look at the story of the early church in Acts 2, how they modeled living in community with one another to accomplish our mission of making disciples. And so first we're going to take another quick look at our process um, this is the process that we've been working on and, and coming up with as far as how, you know, all churches have that mission from Matthew 28, 19, and 20 to go and make disciples. So that's, that's our mission. But how do we do that here at the Brook? What does that look like? And so this is the process. Um, Robbie preached last week about sharing the gospel with the lost through relationships, sharing the gospel through relationships with the lost. This week, we're learning and, and emphasizing living in community, living in community with other believers. And the vehicle for that, the way that we carry that out here at the Brook is community groups. Now, you may have heard of them as small groups or life groups or, you know, church groups, Sunday school classes. There's a lot of different ways that we label things. Here at the Brook, the language that we use is community. Um, and so we call them community groups. That is our vehicle for living in community with one another. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that we weren't meant to do life alone. We really were not meant to do life alone. And we can go back and look early in Scripture, in Genesis chapter 2, after God created Adam, 
one of the first things that he said was, it is not good for man to be alone. Now, this is at the beginning of creation. God creates the first man and immediately says it's not good for him to be alone. And so what does he do? He creates Eve, gives him a helper, a mate. To me, that speaks to the importance of community, right? Now, I had, I had the privilege of doing a wedding, <clears throat> excuse me, the week before last. I was in here and I did a wedding and I shared a passage from Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12. And this is what it says. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no one to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one is who, one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, if we fast forward to the Gospels, after Jesus had spent time with his disciples, he began sending them out. And we see this in Mark chapter 6, and you might, you might re remember how he sent them out. How did he send them out? Two by two. So he sent them out in pairs. Now, this, there was this Jewish tradition that, that was introduced in the law, when the law was introduced in, in Deuteronomy, about two witnesses, you know, that it's better to have two witnesses. And so that's probably some of the rationale behind what Jesus was doing. But I also believe that there's this concept of co-laboring together, of collaboration, and there's power in that. There's power in shared ministry when two or more people are working together to accomplish the same goal. There is power in that. They are more likely to be successful in that. And I believe that Jesus is modeling that here. He's showing us how. Now, if we go back even further, uh, back up to, to Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 3, this is the first time that Jesus is circling up with his disciples. He's assembled the 12, and he's circling up with them. And it says this in Mark 3, 14. It says, And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be, what? With him and he might send them out to preach. Now, when I read that, it's really easy for me to read right over that they, so that they might be with him and send them out to preach. That, it's easy to miss, but there, that is critical. That relationship, that community, that circle of the 12, that they would be with him, they would be transformed by him, and then they would be sent out to change the world. So it seems pretty clear to me that we were meant to be together in community. Put another way, that we are better together living in community. All right, so we're going to have a little bit of fun here. We're going we're gonna to work with some misused idioms. Do you all know what an idiom is? I had to look it up. I know I knew it at one time, but I had to Google it. I was like, what is an idiom? Um, but we're going, to look at it, we're going to look at misused idioms, phrases, and mispronounced words, all right? This is going to be fun. So song lyrics are one of the first things that we all botch, right? Like we think, we, we think it's saying one thing, and so we're singing it, singing along with it, and singing it confidently, and then we find out later when we read the lyrics that it wasn't saying that at all. Anyone? I, I, I could tell you a hilarious story right now, but I'm not going to embarrass my wife like that. But song lyrics, it happens all the time with song lyrics, very commonly. But also with common phrases like this one, for all intensive purposes. It's, what are intensive purposes? <laughs> for all intents and purposes is the correct phrase. Here's one, this one right here is like nails on a chalkboard to me. Irregardless. <laughs> Ugh. I mean, regardless is enough. Like, it works just like that. We don't have to add the era at the beginning of it. How about this one? 
I could care less. You know what I mean. No, it's I couldn't care less. I, in fact, I couldn't care any less. If you're saying I could care less, then that means you care a lot. So say it right, for Christ's sake. Uh, all right, so here's one. How many of you have ever heard this quote? This is, and this is an idiom, by the way. Blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. That's a pretty commonly used phrase. And it, when it's used, it means that, that blood... Blood relatives, familial relations have a higher priority in the order of things, in the order of relationships, and in the order of community. Blood family matters more, right? Blood family is more important than everything else. But that's actually a misused idiom. And it comes from a quote, an early, early quote that says this, and it's often mistaken for being in the Bible. Like people say this is from the Bible. And it's not, but, it, but the quote is this, the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Now, if you unpack that, it actually means the opposite of blood is thicker than water, right? It's saying the blood of the covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ that unites us all together in covenant with him takes priority over the water of the womb, which would mean familial relationships. And so that sets up really well this next passage that we're going to look at in Mark chapter 3. We're going to see what Jesus has to say about spiritual family. In Mark 3, verses 31 through 35, I'll have it up here on the screen, but if you would follow along with me in your Bible or your Bible app, Starting in verse 31, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. Now, what was going on here was Jesus had been going around preaching, doing miracles. The, the apostles were performing miracles, signs and wonders, and, and it was causing quite a stir in the land. And... People, the, the Pharisees certainly didn't like it, but even his family, you know, you, you, we all have like that one family member that's like embarrasses us all. Like Jesus's family was thinking, oh my gosh, he's, he's causing a stir. Like he's, he's bringing too much attention to our family and to our name. And so they were, they were going to get him, to tell him, hey dude, like let's bring it down a notch. You're causing a stir. And so they said, your mother and your brothers are outside. They're seeking you. And in verse 33, he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here, here are my mother and my brothers. He, he, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So what is Jesus saying here? Without severing his relationship with his earthly family, he's emphasizing the priority of the messianic community of faith, the spiritual family. He's making the point that it is as important, if not more, than blood family. In fact, we should all consider ourselves blood family as we are bound together under the blood of the covenant. Jesus shed blood for us. And when we hear brothers and sisters in Christ, that's not just church speak. That's truth. Capital T, truth. We are brothers and sisters. We are adopted sons and daughters. And Paul reminds us of, of this truth in several of his letters to the first century church. And we're not going to go through and read all these passages because I'm already going to go over 30 minutes today. But I am going to point them out to you so you can write them down and you can read them. But Romans 8, 14 through 17, Paul reminds us of this. Galatians 4, 1 through 7, again, and Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. So one online dictionary defines family 
and community like this. A family is a group of two or more persons related by birth, marriage, or adoption who live together. All such related persons are considered as members of one family. And a community is a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. Now, what do we all have in common? See, we were all born into the family of Adam. But in Christ, we are all adopted sons and daughters. In Christ, what does in Christ mean? It means that we have to believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that he is, he's done what he said he would do and he's doing it even still today. And if we do that, then we are adopted into his family. Then we are covered by that blood covenant. Now, as the community pastor here, I do a lot, I, I think a lot about community. I think a lot, I pray a lot about community. And what does it mean to be in community here at the Brook Church? And I've kind of boiled it down to this one phrase that I think kind of sums it up for me really well. This whole idea of being in community and, and a discipleship community, making disciples with each other in community, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples, and it's this, becoming like Jesus together. We see that in the Gospels. That is exactly what happened with the 12. Now, Robbie taught early on in this series that a disciple is one who, and I should quiz you all right now, one who what? follows Jesus, one who is transformed, man, y'all are good, being transformed by Jesus, and one who is what? On mission, committed to the mission of Jesus. Y'all are really good. There's going to be another quiz next week. That is exactly what happened with the 12. They were with him, and because they were with him, following him, they were transformed by him, and then they are on mission. They are committed to the mission, and we are all here today because of their commitment to that mission. Amen? Now, turn to our key passage, if you would. We're going to be in Acts 2, 42 through 47. We're going to look at this model of the early church. And you may have heard this before, but it's okay if you hear it again. This passage is the, the passage that the Brook Church was founded upon 28 years ago. And it's a beautiful picture of authentic Christian community, of believers in relationship with each other, with other believers, doing life with one another. And so as we unpack this passage together today, we're going to seek to define what it means to live in community here at the Brook, and we're also going to seek to define what community groups are at the Brook so that, so that we all have a clear understanding and that we're all speaking the same language and using the same terminology. So to set that up, I want to lay out four components of discipleship as it relates to community groups, as they relate to community groups. And they are, and you can write these down, but we're going to go through and unpack each one. So the first one is a biblical foundation. It is critical that we have a biblical foundation. The second is a relational environment, that we create an environment that, that allows relationships to flourish. The third thing is intentional leadership. We've got to have intentionality in how we are leading others. And then the last is multiplication. Multiplication. You didn't think we were going to do math in the message today. Um, we started with uh, Ryan's giving statement. You know. Multiplication. Um, and I'm, I'm really passionate about multiplication and not not 
not math multiplication, like from math class, but multiplication in terms of making disciples. And so um, I'm excited to end with that. But we're going to jump into Acts 2, 42 through 47. We're going to read that together. So if you would follow along, starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So let's look at the first part, the first half of verse 42. What is the first thing that they devoted themselves to in the early church? The apostles' teaching, the apostles' doctrine, whatever your translation says, it's the apostles' teaching or doctrine. So what is that? What were they teaching? The gospel. They were teaching the gospel. They were teaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the first component, write this down, the first component of our community groups here at the Brook Church is a biblical foundation. We are going to put the apostles' doctrine first, and that is Scripture. In our church doctrinal statements, which are published on our website, they're in our member packet, there's a sentence that reads like this. We are a conservative, evangelical, Christian church. That's good. But this second part is even better. That believes the Bible, teaches it in its entirety, and seeks to practice its truth. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. It is flawless, it is without error, and it is our singular source of truth. We hear all the time, this, that's my truth, that's your truth. That's what is even, what is that? I mean, there's one source of truth, and it's the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Any, any Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scouts in the room? Let's see hands. Yeah, so y'all y'all know y'all are really familiar with the magnetic compass, right? Anyone else ever used a magnetic compass in here? See, we live in a in an age now where we have these, you know. We don't we don't even really have to deal with the magnetic compass anymore. I don't I mean, do they even still use it in the scouts? Okay. Okay. I, I figured they did, but we have satellite technology now. We've got Google Maps. And even I grew up with parents who could navigate, you know, they used the old paper maps, but they would memorize the routes. And they knew how to drive, you know, six to eight hours to grandma's house without ever even looking at a map. And I've gotten so dependent on that, that on Siri, like narrating the directions for me, that I, I'd be lost without it, honestly. But going back to that magnetic compass... A magnetic compass is not a terribly reliable instrument. Why is that? So, yeah, magnetic north. There's, there's magnetic north, which is the magnetic north pole, and then there's, the, there's true north, and true north is the geographic north, okay? The GPS, these Google Maps, they use true north, not magnetic north. Now, the difference between magnetic north is, is currently, right now, between magnetic north and true north is several hundred miles. 
In, in terms of latitude and longitude, coordinates-wise, it's like 60 to 80 degrees, but it can fluctuate anywhere from 20 to 60 degrees. Um, that's crazy. And so I don't know that I would want to rely on a magnetic compass if I were trying to get to a destination. If we were all, as a church, asked to go to the same spot and we were given magnetic compasses, the likelihood that we would all end up in the same place together um, is, is slim to none. It's risky. Now, that's why we say that the biblical foundation is critical. That's why we say biblical foundation, having the Bible as our source of truth, is the number one component of living in community here. And it's because when we have Jesus, when we have his word as our true north, we know for sure that he is the constant, unchanging source of truth and life, right? He is the same yesterday and today and forever. The philosophies, the theories, the concepts, and the schemes of man are constantly shifting. Our world is, I mean, you don't have to look very far. Just look on social media, and our world is as wishy-washy as it can get. But the word of the Lord endures forever. When we say that Jesus is our true north, we are acknowledging that we live in danger of being tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. In such a tempestuous world, we, we have to have Jesus at the center. We have to have Jesus as our true north any time that we plot our course Earlier in the 915 service, we sang about fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's what we've got to do. We've got to fix our eyes on him who is our true north. When we say that he's our true north, we glorify the Lord who defines justice and righteousness and moral standards that align with his nature. They'll keep us on the correct course. Just as a compass that aligns with true north keeps us moving in the right direction. As for God, his way is perfect. Psalm 18.30 says, the, the, the Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. Listen, people in our community groups, we are going to put the Bible first. We are going to read, study, and teach the Bible. The early church modeled this for us. The apostles' doctrine was first in the early church, and so we're going to put it first, and we're going to equip you to do this. The second component of our community groups, write this down, is a relational environment. Again, looking at Acts 2, we can see a picture of this. In the second half of verse 42, it says, and the fellowship and the fellowship. Koinonia is the Greek word. It's that intimate joint partnership between us and God, between believer and believer. To the breaking of bread and the prayers, the fellowshipping together, the eating together, praying together. And then jumping to verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. We recently did a discipleship training here in this room, and we were about half full of, of community group leaders and apprentice leaders and, and potential and future leaders. Um, and we, we did an exercise where we, we rated our community groups, the groups that we were in currently or even past groups that we were in, and we rated them on a scale of one to five in these areas that I'm, I'm going to talk you through in just a moment. But it was it was both encouraging and convicting for me personally. Um, these are some of the key components to creating and enjoying the life-giving community that we are called to. And so the first one, and these aren't necessarily in a particular order, but the first one is, is a safe place. A safe place 
where we show compassion for one another, where we pray for one another and demonstrate a spirit of gentleness with one another, that we're, we're careful with humor and, and we hold confidentiality up here. What happens in group and what is said in group, it, it stays within the context of the group and that creates safety. A relaxed atmosphere, it's friendly, it's casual, it's welcoming. Transparency and vulnerability. Can we share openly and honestly with one another like God's word called us, calls us to do, e including the struggles and the things that we don't really want to talk about? Authenticity. Being able to be who God called you to be, the true you, without fear of judgment or condemnation. Are we practicing listening with one another? Are we practicing patience with one another? This one's really interesting right here, small group size. So we have 10 groups right now currently at the Brook, and they're all a pretty good size right now. Like we're in need of multiplying, we're in need of growing. But why is the size of the group, why does that matter? Why is it important? We, we're recommending that, you know, a group is somewhere anywhere between 4 and 12. We've got some groups right now, including my own, that are over 12. 12 is a good number. It's biblical. But 12 is also, like, the, the average number of people that we can, you know, adults, we can have in our homes. And, it, and we fit. We fit around the tables. We fit in the living room, wherever it is that we're studying together. There's room. Because when you walk into a room that's really full and packed and there's not a place for you to sit down or there doesn't feel like there's a place, then it, then it, it sends a subconscious message that this is, there's not a place for me here. This is not welcoming. And so that's why it's important. Groups are, are to be caring. We see all through this passage in Acts 2.42, the meeting of needs caring and meeting each other's physical needs, shepherding one another. Biblical foundation, we just talked about it. Having that biblical foundation, we're going to use biblical storytelling to apply biblical truth in our groups. Mutual accountability. Lovingly and courageously addressing behaviors that don't glorify God. That one right there, that one, that was like a dagger. Just, psh, ooh. Healthy dialogue, guided practice, guided practice. Allow others to practice leading and storytelling and, and praying. That's part of that shepherding and, and apprenticing, and I'm going to talk more about that in the next section. Uh, consistency, intentionality, encouragement, building one another up, speaking life to one another. These are the components of a life-giving community. These are the components of the relational environment that we seek to have in our community group ministry here at the Brook. Now, I'm going to wrap up this section with probably the most important aspect of a community group. Can anybody guess what it is? Food. Food. A community group is not a community group if you don't have food. I mean, it's just that simple. If you look at Acts 2.42, it says, and the fellowship and the breaking of bread, like it's in there. So you got to have food. And food's always been a way that we connect with one another. It is, it is an, especially in the Western culture, it's an American pastime. But I mean, it's, I think it's a global thing. It just is the way that we connect with one another over food. And we see Jesus so many times in the Gospels, in people's homes, eating with them. And the second one is homes. You know, we, we meet in people's homes because that's, where, that's a great place. It's a very comfortable, relaxed atmosphere and a way to connect and get to know people and let your guard down. And then this last one is have fun. Our group, we have fun. We, we, are, we do life together. We, we have fun when we meet for group, um, but we also have fun outside of that. We get together and we, we, go, we go to parties. We go and do things together. We do social events together. We enjoy hanging out with each other. The, the men will hang out and do something together. The ladies will get together and they'll have girls' night. Um, 
We enjoy being together. Let me ask you this. Would you be okay if you invited someone over to your house and the very first time they came in, they, they walked right past you to your kitchen and opened up your refrigerator? Anyone cool with that? Look, or your pantry. <laughs> Y'all, it's, that's not something you do on the first visit. It's just not. But through relationship, through, through relationship, we can get there. And people can become family. And then it's, then it's, hey, make yourself at home. And I genuinely mean that. Make yourself at home. Help yourself to whatever it is that you want or need. Mi casa is su casa. And that is true. And we have people in our lives who have those refrigerator rights and those pantry rights. And they, they can go and they can get what they want. And even if it's my smart food white cheddar popcorn and they eat all of it. I have to like stash a couple of bags away and somewhere else so that I know I'm going to have some. You know, that stuff is like gold. <laughs> but it's the relational environment that is so important and so conducive to, to discipleship. So the third component of our community groups, and I'm going to have to hurry up. Third component is this, intentional leadership. So Robbie has used the analogy of a child maturing to adulthood and ultimately becoming a parent, him or herself, to illustrate this path of discipleship. And last week, he emphasized sharing the gospel with the unbeliever, or the lost, or the spiritually dead. And so we're going to look in 1 Peter 3.15 at a very clear instruction that Peter gives for sharing the gospel with an unbeliever. He says this, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, and always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so we can see intentionality here pretty clearly. Peter gives three instructions for sharing with unbelievers. First, we are to make Christ our Lord. We are to lead by example. Sharing the gospel is obeying Christ. Second, we are to always be prepared to give an explanation, to share. And finally, be gentle and respectful while sharing. And so in the same way that we would bring up a child from birth to adulthood, there are different stages. You, you, just like you have an infant, to a toddler, to a child, to a teenager, young adult, parent. The same occurs in spiritual maturity. When someone first becomes saved, we, we call them a spiritual infant or a baby Christian. You might hear that kind of language. And a new believer, someone who hasn't grown in their walk with Christ, they're, they're characterized by ignorance. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. It just means they don't know what they don't know. And so in order to shepherd someone who's a spiritual infant, it, it, it takes, they're dependent a lot more. It takes quite a bit more caring and hand-holding. And then when a spiritual child, they've matured a little bit, they've been a believer for a few years, they're still kind of self-centered and idealistic and may fluctuate between overconfidence and pride or underconfidence, defeat. But to shepherd someone who's a spiritual child, you've got to be in relationship with them at a deeper level. You've, you've got to help them along, help them build a more meaningful relationship with God by teaching them things, how to pray, how, you know, pointing them to the Bible. Spiritual young adult. It's going to look a little bit different with a spiritual young adult. It's that intentionality, though. It's being able to see where people are. It's being able to listen for understanding and clarity. Listen to the things that they say. Listen, listen to the questions that they ask. And you will, you will get clues. You will know where they are. And, if, and, then it, and then you ask for clarification so that you can help be intentional about how you're guiding and discipling those in your care and in your community. And if we examine our passage of, of uh, Acts 2, 42 through 47, 
we see this intentionality happening from start to finish. All these amazing things that were taking place in this passage, they were taking place because of the intentionality of the people, the intentionality of the apostles, the leaders. These things weren't just happening by chance, and they don't. These two churches, the Brook Church and Village Park Church, united together as one family, one big, beautiful, blended family. That didn't happen by chance. It happened because of God first, but it happened because of the, the humble heart posture of the leaders of both churches and the church bodies and their commitment to praying and seeking God's will first. That's why it happened. So intentional leadership. And lastly, the fourth component of our community groups is multiplication. First of all, multiplication is our mission. If we are not multiplying, then we are not fulfilling the Great Commission. It was a mandate. It was a commandment. It was not a suggestion. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, this, this, is, how it, this is how it ended for Jesus and the twelve, as it were, but it's also how it began for us. It started with a simple invitation. He, Jesus said, come, follow me. Three words. Come and see. Three words. And after a time of being with him, a time of equipping and discipling, it continued with ascending, with a going. So it was a come, follow me, come and see, and now you go. And it continues even today, 2,000 plus years later. Last week, Robbie taught us on sharing the gospel. Look, people need the gospel. We need the gospel. People need Jesus. He's our hope. He's our confident hope. Capital H, hope. Our vision statement here is real people finding real hope in the real world. That H is capital H. It's not a wishy kind of hope. The thing is, we need community too. We need each other. And we experience that hope together in community. We have got to have a come and see mindset. Or as Robbie shared in the story about his old roommate who had the, the moldy honey bun, the honey mold, as he called it, he's like, dude, you got to see this. Like we do that with, we do that with books, with movies, with foods, with all manner of things. We've got to adopt that same mindset when it comes to the gospel. We've got to adopt that same mindset when it comes to inviting others into the life-giving community of the church. So let's create it. Let's create it together. Let's create the invite culture, that come and see culture that Jesus modeled for us. So think about all those things I talked about earlier in the relational environment part. Like, all the things that you experience in your small group or in your community of friends, close, close people, the safety, the vulnerability, the trust, the security, the meeting of needs, all those things. And then think about everyone who's outside of that right now, who's just waiting for an invitation to come in and experience that for themselves. Everybody wants it. We all have different ways of going about it, different personalities. Some of us are introverted and we're not gonna go and invite ourselves into something. Others of us will just walk right up, right on in and 
make ourselves at home and open up the refrigerator. Um, but we've got to be considerate of everyone and invite them in to experience that. So I'm going to put a couple of slides up here as we wrap up to illustrate this idea of what we tend to do versus what we're called to do. So this on the left, this is what we tend to do. Okay, we tend to form a circle, a safe circle of community. It's very life-giving and we create safety and trust and, and all the good things are happening in here. So this is, not, this is not all bad. I'm not saying that. But there's risk and danger associated with this because it's closed off. There's a tendency for this to become a click. These people all hang out together, but everybody on the outside, there's, there's, notice there's no opening here. There's no way in. There's good stuff happening here, but it, it can tend to become a click or stagnate. Think about the Dead Sea. Why is the Dead Sea dead? Because there's no outflow. The Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea, but nothing is flowing out of it, and so it cannot sustain life. There's no outflow here. But look over here. There's an inflow and an outflow. Our communities are not always going to stay the same. Many of us have communities and circles of friends from years ago who we were in groups with or friends with, and we're we're not in a group with them anymore, but are we still friends with them? Yes. Are they still family? Absolutely. Can they still come over and eat your popcorn? 100%. But there's a coming and a going. There's, there's a, an invite and then there's a sending and then there's an equipping happening in here. Next slide, please. And then you see multiplication happening. This begets another group, begets another small community, and we have multiplication happening. This, this is a picture of the Great Commission right here. And so this is, is what we're aiming for. And I'm going to close with this, Acts 247b, second half and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Because we created an opportunity, we fostered an environment of life-giving community, just like the early church, and God blessed it. In verse 41, in Acts 2, 41, right before this passage, what happened? 3,000 believers were added to this faith community after the Pentecost. So we have an opportunity before us today. So let me close this in prayer, and then we're going to wrap up with, with a call to action. God, I just thank you so much for this day, this chance that we have to be together as a family. I thank you for the truths of your word. I pray that they would penetrate our hearts deeply. I pray that we, we would be challenged today, inspired and encouraged to act, to move. 